Hey there, Sharon here from The Curious Piano Teachers and wherever you are in the world, I hope you're having a wonderful day. Now I'm really excited to be doing yet another one of these videos. As you may know, I am doing a Teaching Ideas project um, that's spanning 12 months and the idea is that every month I take a piece and then I dig into the ideas that I would have to, um, to teach that to my students and I just share with you my ideas. I'm sure quite a lot of them will not be new ideas, um, but it's just my thoughts and I know that I've been having some lovely, lovely feedback. Thank you so much to all of you who have got back to me so far um, and said that you've been really enjoying and benefiting from the videos and, um, and the blogs. Now, today's piece is, again, another piece that's taken from um, the fairly recent LCM examination syllabus. It's on grade two, and it's a piece called Watermark by Louise Chamberlain. Now, you probably know Louise Chamberlain better as Pam Wedgwood. Pam Wedgwood, um, she uses the pseudonym Louise Chamberlain every so often. So this is a piece by, um, by Pam Wedgwood. So without further ado, I'm going to play it for you. And then I'm really excited. I'm going to be sharing with you a student workbook. And this is something that you can print out and use with your students. I'm just going to go through the ideas. And then I'm going to finish off with a couple of ideas for practicing. So I'll see you in a minute. such a pretty gentle piece of music and a couple of days ago I sent Pam aka Louise um, a Facebook message just to dig a little bit into the background of it and she wrote back and said that she had this lovely young pupil who was fascinated with the watermarks hidden on certain papers and as she's always on the lookout for original titles, she says here, I thought I would write him a new piece called Watermark. And then this piece went into Pam's Step It Up um, series for grade one, grade two. Um, and there you have it. So uh, apparently the student in question is, um, is still playing the piano and still enjoys playing Pam's pieces. So that's just a little bit of, um, of background for, uh, for this particular piece of music that if your students are learning it, it's always nice to share. So um, let's now dig into the first page of the, the student workbook. So if you haven't yet printed out a copy, I recommend that you go and do that now. Just pause the video, come back, uh, because you will need a copy of this because I'm just gonna go through it. Okay, so you can see there, I have listed all of the bits and bobs that you will need. So I have suggested that you have a laminated A3 copy of the score. Now, I haven't this one laminated simply for the reason that it would be too shiny and you wouldn't be able to see anything I've written on it. But it's a great idea to laminate it because then you can use these dry wipe pens and a baby wipe, it will just come off and the student can have a clean score again. I do also want to just say that whenever we copy music, it can really be solely for the, you know, the, the annotation purposes. So, um, it's really super important that whether it's the Step It Up or whether it's the, um, the Grade 2 LCM, you do want to make sure that you have, and the student has, an original copy of the score. But then, I love to get scores blown up because it just, everything looks bigger, everything looks clearer for the student. Laminated, and you get this fabulous resource. Um, so, pack off your dry white coloured pens. You'll also find these floor spots inside as well. So again, you can print these out. You will need six of them in total. You will also need something like those um, little animal rubbers, erasers. Okay, so I've got a little selection of these as well. Plus then, 
your student um, or yourself will be able to print out and cut out these memory cards. So that's all there whenever you download the PDF, the student resource. So question one is about getting the student to recognize a particular rhythm ingredient. When we teach rhythm as teachers, we want to teach it as a musical concept so that whenever they see, and the example I'm taking here is the dotted crotchet quaver rhythm, so that whenever they see it in another piece, they know what to do with it. That they don't just play the right rhythm in this particular piece, but that they know whenever they see it. So it could be a piece of sight reading, it could be other repertoire, that they have developed, they understand what this means. So that's the first thing the student will then be doing. So you are going to get them to draw a circle around the rhythm um, as it appears on their score. You could do this, some of these in the lesson, you could tick a few and ask the student to do them at home. Obviously, you know your students, whatever works best for them. So I'm just going to really quickly do this. So I'm looking for all the rhythms that are a dotted crotchet and quaver. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Uh, I don't think I've missed any. I think that's it. Okay. <clears throat> so that's the idea where the student just recognizes that like you could look a little bit deeper in because you can see here in bar six it happens the dotted crotchet quiver rhythm is on the second and the third beat whereas in bar seven it's happening between the first and the second beat um okay so again the question two you know how many times is, does this dotted crotchet and quiver rhythm pattern appear they're going to count that and then they are and actually I realized I've missed this one so there is another one and then they will write in the total number in this box here. Okay next question list the bar numbers where this dotted crotchet and quaver rhythm appears and we know as teachers that there is this really simple way of working out bars with most editions anyway it's where here this is bar one, bar six, bar 11, bar 16, bar 21. I know it may seem a really simple thing, but sometimes students will literally, to kind of find bar 20, will go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, the whole way through. So um, you just want them to list the bar numbers where this dotted crotchet and quaver rhythm appears. And then they just write the answers in this box below. So um, it appears in bar six and bar seven. So I'm just gonna write six seven, eight, nine, ten, so nine and ten, and so on and so forth, okay? Then question four, write out the rhythm of bar six and bar seven below. It's just a little theory exercise, it's nothing complicated, but it is important that we get our students to actually write this every so often. Um, and of course, you see that we have things like because this is a B, the stem goes down. Because it's an A, the stem goes up. Um, but the rhythm is the same, regardless of what stem direction. So if you have a student, I mean, it would be interesting whether or not in bar um, six, writing out that rhythm, they refer to exactly the same way it's been written or whether they do something like this going the wrong way with this okay so you can see I have drawn all the stems down um, they may have drawn this last note with the stem going up because that's how it's notated in the score at this point it doesn't matter um, again write out the rhythm will some of them try and draw this stave and write it on that I mean obviously what we're focusing on is just the rhythm so the idea is that they are not needing to draw this D, they're not needing to write out the bar as it appears. They're just writing out the rhythm. The next one is to cut out these floor spots. So you get one page of this, and the idea is that you print it six times. 
and then you're going to cut out where you've got these four spots. So um, the other thing you're going to need then is these tiny rubbers or anything at all, something small, something similar to this. And this is what you're going to do. So here's what I mean by these floor spots. And I know for me, this would be one, two, three. I think the way you're looking at it, it'll probably be one, two, three. So that's the way I'm going to do it. So using these, let's say in the first instance, we have a crotchet and two quavers and another crotchet. So the student is going to be able to see that rhythm and then tap one, two and three. One, two and three. If we were to again apply getting a little bit closer to the rhythm that we've got, I've just used a little piece of baker's twine. You could use ribbon, there's any amount of things that you can use. So I'm going to put a tie there, which means that of course this isn't going to sound, this is going to be one, two and three, one, two and three. Again, if we do this, you can see the way I've placed these. So again, further over here is kind of where we've got a sound at the beginning of the beat. This is the second part of the beat. So this, imagine this is our dotted crotchet, our quaver and our crotchet. So here we've got one, two and three, one, two and three. Okay, so the next thing students are going to do is using their score, they're going to write in the counting. I don't know about you, but I know that my teachers used to do a lot of this. And if I were asked to do it back in my early days as a student, I wouldn't have been able to because I actually didn't understand it very well. So I do think it's really important that every so often we get our students to write in um, the counting. It might be French um, time names, it could be metrical counting. Today I'm going to use metrical counting. But whatever it is, you want them to kind of know exactly. And it's, it's also, it's evidence for us as teachers. If we go away and give them this activity, where they have to do it by themselves, we then get to see what they do, what they don't understand. So um, they're going to write in the counting. I'm just going to start with bar six here. So that's going to be one and two and three and. And they should be showing that under the first two quavers, you've got the one and directly under the dotted crotchet is where they have two. I have put the and as well, so I've done the whole thing in one and two and three and, um, and then the and on the three. So you've got one and two and three and one and two and three and. And the students then are going to be encouraged to just reflect a little bit further on that. So you'll see the next, we've got two boxes here. And it says which bars were the easiest to work out. I mean, possibly it's going to be these top ones where it's just one, two, three. And then which bars were the hardest to work out? And if you wanted to dig a little bit more, you could say, and why? What was, what was more complicated about it? In this particular piece, the rhythms that possibly um, the students will find a little bit more difficult are these dotted crotchet quaver rhythms. Okay, moving on then to question seven on the next page. So the idea is now that they have got their counting written onto the score, they're going to tap the right hand rhythm, so just the right hand rhythm, and count aloud. In time, yes, you, you can get them to coordinate both hands together, but it's just the right hand rhythm for now. And yes, they're going to count aloud because again, isn't it something that we do so often for them? And we do have, you know, if you've got a, a 30 minute lesson, with a student, a weekly lesson, there are 10,050 minutes between lessons. 10,050 minutes, that's a lot of time. And if they do, if they are not clear on how they need to count this in the lesson by themselves, 
if you're doing it for them, then the chances are they're going to struggle at home. So this is why it's really important that we just keep kind of pushing these little jobs onto them. And for us as well, as teachers in the lessons, to just go, okay, can they do this? Do they understand what they're doing? And of course, if they don't, that's when we have to take a step back. We have to figure out what it is they don't understand and then figure out a teaching strategy that's going to work. So, um, again, the idea is, and I'm actually, I'm going to tap this the whole way through. Um, I'm just going to get a score right in front of me. Um, as I say, it's not something I was encouraged to do a lot of as a young student, this counting aloud and tapping. Again, just separating the rhythm from actually playing it. So we're just looking at the rhythm here. Just looking at the right hand rhythm and in bar one where you've got a crotchet rest, two crotchet notes, I'm gonna, you'll notice I'm gonna gesture the rest. So one, two, three, one, two, three. And that's really important just so that they feel where that rest is. So ideally you'll have this score of watermark by Louise Jimble in front of you and just follow through and notice what I do. I'm going to do a couple of different things where there are the dotted quaver, dotted crotchet and quaver rhythms. Okay, I'm not going to do the same consistent counting. Um, it's going to be correct both ways, but I just want you to notice what I'm doing um, and I will talk about it at the end. Okay, so here goes. The other thing is get them to count in. One, two, three, one, two, three, one. So did you notice what I did slightly differently in slightly different places? What I did, I'm going to take, let's say, bar six as an example. And one way <clears throat> is actually with a student kind, so one and two and three and the whole way through. So that then, clapping that will sound one and two and three and one and two and three and now the other way is where I really just need to feel the quavers in beats one and beat three so I might do this I might say one and two and one and two three and so I didn't say the and on the two I just said one and two three and one and two three Either way is correct. Sometimes students get a little bit confused when they're not putting in all of the, the ands, the subdivisions. So in the first instance, it maybe is an idea to keep that in, or one and two and three and, and that they realize that inside a dotted crotchet, you've got three quavers, so that's going to be two and three and. So yeah. Do not underestimate just how important it is for us to get our students to do the counting. It's really no good if we're counting for them. Um, and again, they've got that self-reflection there in question seven. So which bars felt the easiest to tap and count? Which bars felt the most challenging to, get to tap and count? And again, it's not to say that they have to play the whole right hand the way I tap or tap the whole right hand the way I did there they might just do the first eight bars and then the next eight bars and then you can see in question eight the question is how are you going to practice the bar where the rhythm felt most challenging and they're going to then 
write down exactly what it is they're going to do. So you'll have explained, to, you'll have shown them, you'll have demonstrated how it works and then you're going to be leaving them to say, I'm going to, and they should be able to be clear about the answer in there. If they're not, if they write a really vague, hazy type of answer, it's great because it's for us as teachers, we go, okay, they haven't fully got it. Okay, so let's move on and going into the next page. So starting with question nine, this is more about rhythm. I've done a really big focus on rhythm in this piece. And it says, once you're feeling more confident, tap the right hand rhythm for the whole piece and record yourself. And kids love doing this. Kids do love recording themselves. Um, and then the idea is they watch the video back and they complete the self-assessment. So again, this is actually probably better done if it's maybe not, maybe not the whole piece. I know I've said the whole piece there, but you know, for a certain eight bars of the piece. Um, and there, what they're doing is self-evaluating. So you can see they tick the box that applies. Was it not great? Just okay? Pretty good? Or it's like, yeah, I rocked it. So then there is a box that if it wasn't so good, they get to express what it is they want to improve for next time. So what is it that they're going to need to do in order to move forwards? And again, self-evaluation is such an important part of what it is we are teaching them to do. Partly because of that 10,050 minutes thing that I mentioned earlier. If they're not clear on what's happening in the lesson, then they're gonna be really hazy about it for when they go home to practice. And you know what it's like? If we're not so sure about how to do something, it's like a big black cloud and we just put off doing it. And then of course, what happens to our student, you know, they haven't really understood what it is they're supposed to do. They go home, they keep putting it off because they go, I have no idea what I'm meant to be doing. And then they come back to the next lesson and they tell us that they haven't practiced. So let's really aim to motivate our students to practice by being really clear and by just taking a bit of time and space in the lesson, not by trying to squeeze in lots and lots of things, but the things that we do do making sure that before they leave the lesson we are clear that they have understood it so that we've had that chance to to figure out have they got it can they demonstrate to me that they've got it so important okay and then finally for this rhythm section place this spotted memory card so we've got two different types of cards we've got these spotted ones and then we've also got the ones with the lines Okay, so place the spotted memory cards over every bar with the following rhythm. So it's the rhythm with the dotted crotchet, the quaver, and the crotchet. So I can see here bar seven, so I'm going to stick one here. I have needed to just cut these cards down a little bit, so when you print them out, just kind of make them a tiny bit smaller. And then what am I looking for? A dotted crotchet, quaver and crotchet rhythm, okay. And then the idea is they will tap the right hand rhythm through, again, counting aloud, but there's also a little bit of a memory game here. So they've got to remember that what we've got in underneath here is a one and two and three and a one and two and three and. So I'm just gonna do this line here, one, and three and one and two and three and one two three one and two and three and one and two and three and one okay yes you might need to I think I probably needed to shave that card a little bit more because I wasn't able to see the dotted minute behind it okay and then they're to place this striped memory cards over every bar that has the dotted crotchet quaver, two quaver rhythm. So one, two, three, one, two, three, and another nice way of actually doing this is where you cover up this and if you're doing this in the lesson with them and you actually tap the rhythm. Maybe counting it aloud. One, two, and three, and one, two, and three, and 
and then you get them to take that from orally going, okay, so what does that rhythm look like? So that's a really nice oral activity. That I've just thought of, and this is what happens. You know, we, we kind of have these ideas um, and sometimes it's a good idea just to write them down because they're going to be used with so many other pieces. Um, okay, so I'm going to pop one in there and another one in there. And then there are another two <coughs> here and here. Yeah, okay. Okay, that's just remembering, okay, what's in underneath here. The rhythm is a one and two and three. One and two and three under here. One and two and three and one. And then doing it the whole way through. Okay, so we've got a one and two and three and one and two and three. One, two, three. One and two and three and one and two and three and one, two, three. One, two, three. Okay, so moving on then to the next section of the student workbook and this is being curious about the fingering and the melodic shapes so what you will need is again your uh, laminated a3 copy of the score again the wonderful thing is when it's annotated when it's laminated you can just rub out all of the um, the markings that have been made before and start afresh and a pack of dry white colored pens as well and on the laminated score, the student is going to write in all the fingers for the right hand part for the following bars. And it's just to get them to think about it. It's not that they will need this in the score. It's just, uh, okay, go think about it. What fingers will you use? So for example, if I just take this away, so bars six to 11. Okay, bar six, we've got a D. And we've got two fingers indicated. We have got a finger one and a finger three in bar seven. So the student has to figure out, oh, how do I work out what finger I'm going to have on that D? Of course, what they're going to do is they're gonna look a little bit further back. Um, they can use the piano for this activity or they may just, you know, on a tabletop, um, finger it, imagine it. So there's a five here. So if we like, that's that's our clue. A five, is it'll end be a two on the A, a three on the B. So when we come to that D, we're gonna have a five. It then falls a fourth. So what finger is gonna be an A? It's going to be a two. Up a step to a B, so that's going to be a three. Back to an A, a two. They've put in the one for us, so yeah, that's perfect. We get back to a one. And then we've got a third finger over again. They've given us that information. And then it's a two on the E, because that moves down a step, and a one on the D. Um, and then <clears throat> the next question, how many times do you bring over a finger between bars six and eight? So again, we're looking at this section of the music, fingering it. Um, again, do they do it with the rhythm? One other thing that I do with students so that they're not getting distracted by other musical elements is just to say, okay, I want you to tap out the fingers on a tabletop and because we're in three, four, ignore the rhythm, but because we're in three, four, Okay, you've got a five, so it's going to be imagining, and again, they're actually, you're wanting them to see it in their mind's eye that it's a D they're playing. Okay, so it's going to be then five, five, and they just do it three times, two, three, two, one, and here it is, three over on the F sharp, two, one. Okay, I mean, another way, sometimes, Children do find it quite hard to imagine where they're at. Um, 
So even to airplay it on a keyboard is an idea. Or again, you can get sometimes those um, larger keyboards. I'm thinking of the ones uh, that Peter Simpson at um, Simpson's Signs website sells. Something like that. Okay, again, it's just another activity, getting them to really think about it. And that very pointed question, how many times do you bring over a finger between bar six and eight? Okay, just once. Uh, the other question that you could ask them as a teacher is, so where exactly does that happen? And then the third question, how many times do you bring under a thumb between bars six and 11? So again, they're looking a little bit further through that and figuring out where they are bringing a thumb in underneath. Why are these questions here? When they're actually asked, when questions are asked and when students have to think about an answer, it just means they are more conscious about what it is they're doing. So again, a student playing this phrase here will already, again, just in isolation, have been looking at the fingering, not worrying too much about what the rhythm is, um, and going, okay, yeah, I can see what's happening. What I'm doing is I'm coming down there, I'm gonna have a third finger, it's gonna be coming over on my F sharp, and then I'm gonna be stepping down another couple of steps after that. Question four, the melodic shape of bars six to 11 and a 14 to 16 is based on, and they've got to decide on, is it triad shapes or is it scale shapes? And again, from what you can see and hear, hear there, it's scale shapes. And then they are asked to write a G major scale, one octave going up and down using a G or a treble clef and adding in the key signature. So that again is just getting them to do a little bit of writing. And over the page, question six, write a G major scale, the difference is, they're going to be writing this going up and down an octave using uh, an F clef or a bass clef. Question seven, what are the notes in the following root position triads? Um, you can see there I have asked for a G major, D major and E minor. And the reason for that is you have these particular shapes at the piano. So let me just illustrate that to you. I'm going to hop over to the piano and show you exactly what I mean. Okay, so on that question seven, what are the notes in the following root position triad? So G major, they'll fill in G, B, D, D major, D, F sharp and A, E minor, E, G and B. Because what you will notice is that in this piece, we do have those triad shapes. If you look at bar five, in the left hand, and I'm just going to now do part of the next question, which it says, on your nominated score, draw the following shape around every root position triad you can find. Uh, it might look slightly different to what they expect a root position triad to be, where you can actually see the notes sitting um, one on top of each other lined up um, but this is still a G major triad and it's important that they do see these shapes so one, two, three, we've got a G major triad and again they will just circle every other occurrence of that um, <clears throat> then they will also look out for the D major triad um, and the D major triad if you've already spotted it I'm going to draw a triangle Round the D major triad in bar 11. So it comes in there at the end of that phrase. Okay, and then we have in bar 7 our E minor triad. So just have a listen out for that. At the very end of the 
student workbook, you'll see that there are three pages for practice strategies. And the idea is that you introduce them to a couple of practice strategies and then they answer these questions for themselves. So what is it they do? What is the practice strategy? Why do they do it? And then to do a reflection on how having this practice strategy has, has helped them improve. So the first strategy, I'm going to share three strategies with you now. And the first one is how you can use a sequence. Now, you'll notice in the very first bar, we've got this pattern. Technically, I think there's quite a lot going on in there. Um, you could very easily make it sound a lot less gently lapping, which is what the, the piece says, and it can sound easily quite a lot more angular. You want that nice gentle staccato sound, so dropping into the G and just floating up with those wrists. Almost as if there's just a little puff of air in underneath. So to get students to think a little bit more about the key they're playing in, to identify intervals um, throughout that key, and to also work and develop that technique, here is what I suggest they do. So in the first instance, they're going to play that fifth in the left hand, and the second in the right hand. If it's a bit too much to do all at once, because what I'm going to do is we're going to move up like this, within the key of G major, if they struggle to do that too much, they can just do one hand at a time and then put it all together. So what I have, I'm just going to turn this down a little bit so that you can see exactly what it is I'm doing. So I have my fifth in the left hand, my second starts on the A and the B in the right hand, and I'm just for three beats going to go one, two, three, and move up. Notice I'm counting in three, and the reason for that is, of course, the piece is in three, four, and so on. And then playing it just as it would be written here, but again, using that sequence ID to practice. Of course, the other technical thing that I should have said is, they've got to hold on to this bass note as well. So again, it could even be enough to get them to do this. And then back hands together. They're having to look out that they don't do this, that there's an F sharp here because it's in G major. But another F sharp coming up in the right hand. Another F sharp. F sharp in the left hand. So that is my practice strategy number one. And again, the sorts of things that they're learning about is identifying and playing intervals of fifths and seconds, um, understanding the technique, holding down that bass note and um, getting that light staccato feel. Okay, on to practice strategy number two, and this is outlining. Now, the left hand does, you'll see, feature this idea of where you're holding down the bass note and then you've got another part. What I suggest initially, because it's moving around the keys quite a lot as well, is that you get the student to do something that I call outlining. So they're just going to play all the notes that they play in that particular bar. So it's going to be one, two, three, two.
and so on. Even in coordinating getting the hands together, they could start off with doing and just finding where those left hand chords are. So that's again about understanding the shapes and the patterns. So again, where you've got those root position triads, um, a mix of different triads there, and plus then particularly in on the fourth line where you have those series of rising sevens. And the third practice strategy is where they work on the coordination of the rhythm. So what they are doing is they're not trying to put it all together at the piano. They're actually just dropping down the piano fall board and doing a bit of coordination work. Picking out those bars that are maybe slightly trickier. So maybe, for example, if I was to take, well, I mean, an easy bar is probably going to be the first one. Again, I'm just going to use fingertips on the fall board like this. So bar one would be... One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, and two, three. Okay, that gets a little bit more tricky, but I think bar six is probably one of the ones that they'll want to just extract, take out, and practice. Where you've got that one, and two, three, and one, and two, three, and one, and two, three, and and so on, until they can actually go through the whole piece, recognizing again those bars that are the same, that have the same rhythm. Uh, and they're, they're tapping the whole way through, coordinating that rhythm, and at that point then, they're able to start and actually play it hands together as well. And that's it. I really hope that you have benefited and enjoyed watching this video. And again, if you find these ideas useful, incorporate them into your teaching, I would love, love, love to hear from you. So until the next time, have a great time teaching and I will be back again next month with another piece. I'll see you then. Bye.